are listening to the voice of Susan Reed singing Where Go the Boats by Robert Louis Stevenson with a musical setting by Tom Scott. A page from this afternoon's edition of Anthology. Sunday at 3, WNBC, in conjunction with the Poetry Center of the YW and YMHA, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, brings you Anthology, a selection of readings from poets, past and present, and the music to accompany their poetry. Our guests today, Tom Scott, and by transcription, Robert Blossom and Susan Reed. WNBC is celebrating a domestic travel cave this weekend. We of Anthology mulled over several ideas on domestic American verse and finally came to the conclusion that we'd like to invite as our guest a man who has not only spun many a fine thread into the overall tapestry of poetry Americana, but who is also a radio and TV commentator, a singer of songs in the folk and popular field, and a composer. Listen. <laughs> our guest composed for the radio documentary series, The 38th Parallel. This afternoon, we're going to talk to him about his music and also about the work which he's done in composing musical settings for many distinguished British and American poems. Tom Scott, we're most delighted to have you with us on this American Travelcade edition of Anthology. Thank you. Should I say Mr. Fleetwood or just Fleetwood? Either one. Oh, well, I'm very pleased to be here. And I must congratulate you on that show that you do every night, all night long, which has brought so much pleasure to me and so many other in the so many acts. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you, but I don't want to take our time this afternoon talking about my show because I could go on forever about that. I think we could also go on forever about some of the things you've done. How did you first get the idea of setting, your, setting these poems to music? Well... First, because I am a composer, and second, because I am a singer of folk songs. Uh, folk songs, I think, are highly poetic. I often feel that the words, the lyrical content, is even more important than the music. So it was only natural that through singing so very many songs, I would become highly interested in uh, the words, highly interested in the way words and music are related. And then I've always loved poetry and have been a poetry reader all my life, and then as a composer, I'm always looking for a text that I can set or for an idea that I can set. I realize that that's controversial. In fact, to your eminent producer, Mr. Draper Lewis, said that sometimes there is a controversy as to whether or not poetry should be set to music or whether it should just be read cold, and he said that I might express myself on it. Yes, we're constantly getting mail about this thing. You know, some are saying, stop playing that music behind the poetry, and others saying, oh, we love the music. And then, of course, those who, as you, uh, write special music for the poetry. Well, I don't think I have anything terribly original to say about that. 
it is my feeling that uh, music, by virtue of its abstract nature, can weave a meaningful background which will heighten the meaning of the poem, and that also it can very often supply a missing dimension, and that, therefore, it goes with poetry just as well as, for example, music goes with a good film score, with a good film, that is. The score uh, supplies something that uh, is missing otherwise. That is, if it's well set. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, how do you, there is also, of course, a historical precedent. Didn't the old Greeks, when they first, when they recited, didn't they stroke a lute or a lyre and chant with it? Wasn't this the great classic tradition for all poetry reading? As I recall, there was always a lens on hand. And down, down through the ages this has been done. The Irish, the bards, the minstrels, the troubadours, the trouvers, all of them who read poetry with some kind of a musical accompaniment. And uh, this I have tried to do. Obviously, to create a song is, is something else. And uh, there are a great many poems that when you sang them, they have a whole new and additional meaning. As we're talking about two things, we're talking about actually setting words to music and uh, reading words to music. I feel both are considerably enhanced for the addition of music. I would be very interested to know what the opposition has to say. Well, I strongly suspect that uh, it will be something more or less from the purist standpoint. Yes, the purists are always <laughs> uh, To get to a much more uh, technical uh, side of this thing, where were your songs actually recorded, Tom? Well, the ones you're doing today, I believe, the Robert Louis Stevenson, yes, those were done at uh, a very unique concert at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York City last March. I say unique, uh, and it was decidedly unique because it, I was the only composer represented on that program. It was full eating of my music, and uh, I thought I was pretty lucky. In fact, to being a composer of contemporary music, I think I'm pretty lucky to get anything played at all. Mm -hmm. I think I'm very lucky to have it played today on the radio, but to have a whole evening of my music was a rare experience. Uh, what happened was that a uh, very fine conductor by the name of Emmanuel Vardy, who we may know also as a violist, had organized a beautiful ensemble of strings, and he wished to give some concerts, and he and I conceived the idea of doing a series of concerts of American music, uh, sort of one-man shows, and this was the first one. And you may be interested to know that funds for the orchestra for that evening were supplied by the Music Performance Trust Fund in cooperation with Local 802 of the American Federation of Musicians, who are very interested in preserving live music and in doing whatever they can to help live music. And they have been doing some wonderful things about uh, helping to create performances of contemporary music. So that's how it happened. And uh, it was a good concert, and as you will see from the quality of the performance by Miss Susan Reed, who was our guest soloist, and of the accompaniment, accompaniment uh, supplied by Emmanuel Vardy and his strings. This is part of a cycle which I am composing of the famous Robert Louis Stevenson's poems, A Child's Garden of Verses. You will hear Where Go the Boats and Autumn Fires.
You will hear it, however, with, uh, instead of the voices, oboe and French horn. And it's conducted by Emmanuel Vardy and features my friend Robert Blossom as the narrator. The Ballad of the Harp Weaver. <laughs> mother's blood crawl. Little skinny shoulder blades sticking through your clothes and where you get a jacket from God above knows. It's lucky for me, lad, your daddy's in the ground and can't see the way I let his son go around. That was in the late fall. When the winter came, I'd not a pair of breeches nor a shirt to my name. I couldn't go to school or out of doors to play. And all the other little boys passed our way. Son, said my mother, come climb into my lap, and I'll chafe your little bones while you take a nap. And oh, but we were silly for half an hour or more. Me with my long legs dragging on the floor, a rock, rock, rocking to a mother goose rhyme. We were happy for half an hour's time. There was I, a great boy. And what would folks say to hear my mother singing me to sleep all day? such a daft way. Men say the winter was bad that year. Fuel was scarce and food was dear. wind with a wolf's head howled about our door, and we burned up the chairs and sat upon the floor. All that was left was a chair we couldn't break, and the harp, the harp with a woman's head, nobody would take for song or pity's sake. One 
night before Christmas, I cried with a cold. I cried myself to sleep like a two-year-old. And in the deep night, I felt my mother rise and stare down upon me with love in her eyes. I saw my mother sitting on the one good chair, a light falling on her from I couldn't tell where, looking nineteen and not a day older, and the half of the woman's head leaned against her shoulder. in the thin tall strings for so we we weaving wonderful things many bright threads from where I couldn't see were running through the harp strings rapidly and gold threads whistling through my mother's hand I saw the web grow and the pattern expand she wove a child's jacket and when it was done she laid it on the floor and wove another one Over the red cloak, so regal to see. She's made it for a king's son, I said, not for me. But I knew it was for me. She wove a pair of breeches, quicker than that. She wove a pair of boots and little cocked hats. She wove a pair of mittens. She wove a little blouse. She wove all night. Still cold house. She sang as she worked, and the harp strings spoke. Her voice never faltered, and the thread never broke. And when I awoke, there sat my mother the harp against her shoulder, looking nineteen and not a day older. A smile about her lips, and a light about her head, and her hands in the harp strings, frozen dead. And piled up beside her and toppling to the skies, with the clothes of a king's son, just my size. number 17, dated Sunday, June 20th. Our sincere thanks to Tom Scott for being with us on this special domestic travel cade edition of our program. Next week, as I already promised you, we begin a four-week Shakespearean festival on anthology. We've planned a rather impressive opening program with a scene from Romeo and Juliet, starring Alan Badel and Claire Bloom of the Old Vic Company, and a scene from Julius Caesar with Orson Welles and his company of players, known back in the late 30s as the Mercury Theatre Company. Anthology comes to you with the cooperation of the YW and YMHA Poetry Center, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue, John Malcolm Brennan, Director. The program is produced by Steve White, written and directed by Draper Lewis. Until next Sunday at 3, this is Fleetwood wishing you good luck and good reading. This is WNBC, your community station in New York.